thank you everyone for joining us today. We're so happy to have you. We're gonna start off with a message from our incoming president, Heather Zendash. Hi, I'm Heather Zendash. I am the incoming president of the Maryland Bluebird Society. The Maryland Bluebird Society began in 2004 with a group of passionate members who wanted to preserve and protect the Eastern Bluebirds in our area. Today, we're at Naughty Pine Nursery in Dickerson, Maryland, because there's a beautiful bluebird trail that was installed last year. We have a series of 12 nesting boxes. We monitor them weekly. This allows them to have nesting sites that are protected from their non-native invasive competitors. Birds are sensitive eco indicators. By monitoring their broods and the success of their life cycle, we understand how our environment affects us as well. Each year, we host two events. One is the Bluebirds Forever Festival, and the other is an annual picnic usually in the fall. This year, the Bluebirds Forever Festival will be held online, so you can join us from the comfort of your own home. We're going to have a week-long event from May 17th to May 22nd. Each afternoon, we will be providing you a series of talks that will tell you more about the Eastern Bluebird in our area, how to protect them and encourage their population growth, how to enjoy them in your own backyard, how to garden to encourage insects that they can eat, and how to connect with other Eastern Bluebird lovers like us. Be sure to go to our Facebook page for more information about our free week-long Bluebirds Forever event. You can also go to our website, mdbluebirdsociety.org, for more information about this event as well. Welcome again to our Bluebirds Forever virtual festival. We do ask you to keep your video off, keep yourself muted, and if you have any questions along the way, type them into the chat box. We're gonna start off our event with a presentation from Kathy Kremitzer, who is the outgoing president of the Maryland Bluebird Society, and she'll be presenting Beautiful Bluebirds of Maryland. Kathy is a retired educator and has been a bluebird landlord for over 30 years. During nesting season, she monitors over 80 boxes in Frederick and Washington counties and is part of a four-person monitoring team for the Antietam National Battlefield's 100 nest boxes in Sharpsburg. She joined the Maryland Bluebird Society in 2005 and after serving three terms as president is currently serves excuse me, currently serves as our immediate past president. She's a life member and also serves as a county coordinator for Frederick County. Kathy has been a North, excuse me, North American Bluebird Society board member since 2009 and has served as secretary since 2010. She is an administrator for both the NABS and the Maryland Bluebird Society Facebook pages and responds to many requests for information and assistance especially during the nesting season. She lives in Knoxville, Maryland with her husband and Scotty dog, George, and loves to spend as much time as possible with her children and four grandsons. So with that, Kathy, I will hand that off to you. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me and allowing me to talk to you about my one of my most favorite subjects in the world, uh, bluebirds. Let's go ahead and get started. Beautiful Bluebirds of Maryland. Um, this presentation is sponsored by the Maryland Bluebird Society. The mission and purpose of the Maryland Bluebird Society is to assist in monitoring and increasing the population of the Eastern Bluebird and other cavity nesting birds by educating and informing members and the public about bluebirds. We also support research on the bluebird and its habitats and cooperate with other organizations such as the North American Bluebird Society with similar conservation purposes. And here is my presentation. Beautiful Bluebirds of Somewhere the bluebird is singing and somewhere the skies are blue. So lift up your head to the skies and be happy for this is true. Somewhere the bluebird is singing and winging his way back to you. For those of you who don't know, the bluebird is a medium-sized songbird. 
It's a member of the thrush family, along with its cousin, the American robin. It's a secondary cavity nester, and that means that it nests in cavities, but it is not capable of excavating its own cavities. So it relies on old woodpecker holes, um, not holes in trees, uh, fence posts, um, wherever it can find. Bluebirds are omnivores. They eat mainly insects, but will also eat fruit, nuts, and seeds. They also prefer to nest in open, grassy areas. There are three species of bluebirds, the eastern bluebird, which we have here in Maryland, the western bluebird, which can be found uh, in the lower elevations of the Rocky Mountains and west to the west coast, and then the mountain bluebirds, which are mainly in the higher elevations of the Midwest. The picture on the left is a male Eastern Bluebird. The first thing that draws your attention is that bright cobalt blue on his head, uh, back, wings, and tail. He's got a rusty breast and white underparts. The female on the right is a little bit more subdued in coloring, but no less beautiful. Uh, her head, back, wings, and tail are a dusky, bluish gray and her um, chest is a, a little bit more subdued, rusty color. In nature, oftentimes you'll find that the males are the more conspicuous in color. It is their job to draw attention away from the nesting site and it's the female's job to blend with the nesting site to protect herself and her nesting. Many people ask why bluebirds need our help. Bluebirds, tree swallows, chickadees, tufted titmice, house wrens, all these birds are native cavity nesting birds and they have suffered a loss from habitat. Um, the construction of new houses and commercial venues, uh, shopping centers, malls, uh, have caused the cutting down of old trees and snags, which were their native places to nest, their natural places to nest. They've also suffered from competition from non-native birds, such as house sparrows and starlings. Also, extreme weather and climate change have really impeded their progress. How can we provide safe housing? We need to choose a sturdy, well-built nest box site it in an open grassy area, mount it on a metal pole, freestanding metal pole, and equip it with a predator baffle. Here's a pattern for the stovepipe baffle that I use for most of the nest boxes on my trails. This pattern is also available on the Cialis.org website. Okay. The nesting process for bluebirds runs pretty, um, you, can, you can really kind of get into the feel of it as they begin um, because it, it kind of follows a pattern once they get started. The male will show the female a lot of different nesting sites but she has the final decision on where the nesting will happen. And once she decides that that's where she's going to build her nest, she will put a piece of grass inside the nest box and we call that a claiming straw. She does most of the nest building. The male will go in occasionally and kind of move things around a little bit or check out her progress, but mostly it's the female who does the nest building. She can take a couple of hours or she can take a couple of weeks, depending on her, um, how she feels uh, the, the, the weather is going for, for nesting. Uh, the male will defend the territory and basically be her cheerleader. Bluebird nests are neat in construction. They are um, built of grass or grass and pine needles or just pine needles. Bluebirds are opportunists like mo most other birds and they usually will use materials that are close to the site where they are nesting. Um, 
They'll use dried grass, pine needles, grass rootlets, or a combination of these materials, and then they will line their nest cup with, with softer grass and um, plant fibers for their young. And that way the eggs and the young are more comfortable in that nest. Bluebirds usually lay blue eggs. Um, there are different shades of blue. Some are bright blue, some are pale, almost white. And actually there is a small percentage of uh, female bluebirds that will lay white or pinkish tinged eggs. Uh, this does not affect the embryo growing inside the egg. And usually when a female bluebird lays white eggs, she will always lay white eggs. So let's get started with talking about how the nesting process works. It's really all about the numbers. The female bluebird will lay an egg a day until her clutch is complete. Usually the first nestings are somewhere between four and six eggs. The that's the average clutch size. As the season progresses and bluebirds can nest three or four times in our area, uh, the, the later season clutches tend to be smaller. After the female lays her final egg, she will begin incubating the eggs. And the reason for that is if she started incubating the eggs as she laid them, the eggs would hatch in a staggered way. And bluebird babies develop pretty quickly. So if you have five eggs, one baby would be four days older than all the rest of the babies, and that would give them a, a huge advantage over their siblings. So the female will incubate all the eggs at the same time and begin at the same time so that they all hatch at approximately the same time. The young will fledge from the nest at approximately 18 days of age. Here are some pictures. Uh, the first is hatch day. You can see that the, the egg on the left-hand side, the bluebird baby inside the egg, has used its egg tooth to chip around. And what it will do then is stretch its body and push the egg apart, and then it will crawl out. The picture at the upper right corner is bluebird babies at four days old. The picture at the lower left, the babies are 10 days old. You can really see their feathers coming out of the, of their, at their wings. And then the, ba the picture on the bottom right is actually an interesting uh, nesting that I had happen in my yard. These babies are 17 days old and will be hatching soon, uh, excuse me, fledging soon, except for the baby in the corner on the right-hand side. And that baby is actually a couple of days behind its nest mates because I received a phone call from a woman in West Virginia who told me she had checked her bluebird box and found the mother bird dead on the nest. The eggs had not hatched and she didn't know what to do. And usually a bluebird nesting without a mother bird, uh, the eggs are doomed. Um, in this instance though, um, she called me a couple of hours later, very excited because the eggs were hatching. And so I had her remove the nest from the nest box, put it in a shoe box and bring it to me because I had a nest in my yard of baby birds that had hatched the day before. So we fostered two of the newly hatched babies into this nest. One didn't make it, unfortunately, but the baby in the right-hand corner did. He just fledged a day or two later than the other babies that were in the nest. The interesting facts of life for bluebirds is only the female bluebird can incubate eggs and brood the young since the males do not have a brooding patch on their abdomens. Female bluebirds will continue to brood the young overnight and during cold weather until they're about a week old, and then they can regulate their own body temperatures. Both of the adults will feed the young and remove the fecal sacs from the nest, keeping the nest nice and clean. And both adults will continue to feed the fledged young even after they've left the nest, though the female may begin nest building for her next nesting site. I cannot stress enough for people who want to be involved, involved with bluebirds that if you put up a nest box and you've done everything you can to keep the nest box safe, meaning you've mounted the, the box on a freestanding pole, you've equipped it with predator protection, the most important aspect in bluebirding is that you monitor the nest box. And you do this for several reasons. 
you monitor it to be sure that it that the nesting is progressing as it should be. You monitor it to be sure that the box is being used by a native bird. And you monitor it so that if something is not right, if, if you see that something isn't going as it should with the nesting, you can intervene and possibly save the young. Monitoring visits, you're not gonna stand in front of the nest box and hang out for a half an hour because that would cause the, the adult birds stress and you don't wanna do that. So your monitoring visit is just very short. Uh, you walk up to the box, making enough noise so that if there's a female bluebird inside incubating eggs or brooding the young, she can make the decision to stay or go. You open the box, you look and see what's going on, you close the box, and then you walk away. You can make your uh, uh, recording of your observations after you leave the box. Your observations can be um, a monitoring sheet designated for uh, just the observations on that specific box. You can make notations on your calendar. I would advise you to write your observations down somewhere though, because it's not a good idea to trust things to memory, uh, especially if you monitor more than one box. You also want to refer to your notes uh, from your last visit so you know what to expect at your next visit. As I said, one of the reasons that you need to monitor the nest box is to be sure that it's being used by native birds only. House sparrows and European starlings should never be allowed to use your nest box. House sparrows really are the number one enemy to bluebirds. I can't really zoom in on it, but check it, check the picture on the right of the female house sparrow and take a good look at the beak on her. House sparrows are mainly seed-eating birds and their beaks reflect that. They have that conical beak that Carl, um, excuse me, cardinals and finches have and that beak is for cracking open seed. If you look at the very tip of it, you will see that it has a very sharp hook. That hook becomes a lethal weapon inside a nest box against a bluebird. Bluebirds can defend themselves in, uh, on the outside of the nest box, but in an enclosed area such as uh, a nest box or an, a cavity, the bluebird doesn't have a chance. Scientific studies show that non-native birds that fledge from nest boxes will look for a nest box when it's time for them to breed. All the more reason why you shouldn't allow house sparrows or starlings to nest in your nest boxes. Now a word about the starling. If your bluebird nest box has the recommended one and a half inch opening for Eastern bluebirds, that should exclude European starlings from being able to use them. Uh, where starlings really do the majority of their damage is in native cavities uh, uh, for woodpeckers and other birds that nest in, in, in um, cavities in trees. Um, house sparrows are fiercely aggressive to native cavity nesting birds, and they do not need to use nest boxes because they can be found nesting in the, the, um, the signs at uh, Sheets or CVS or McDonald's or Home Depot. Uh, there are plenty of uh, cavity, uh, excuse me, plenty of nesting sites available to them. Uh, they were imported to America in the 1800, in the 1800s, and there are, are some uh, differences of opinion on why they were brought here. Um, some people feel that they were brought here because a lot of people who had immigrated to the United States were feeling um, homesick for Europe and having house sparrows here, which are native birds in Europe, made them feel a little closer to home. There was also an effort though, to bring the house sparrows here because people thought that they would help protect farmers' crops from damaging insects. Uh, the people who thought that though, unfortunately, did not do their research because 96% of a house sparrow's diet is seed. And so they actually do more harm than good for a, uh, a farmer's crops. 
House sparrows can and will kill bluebirds inside a nest box. They will peck the egg and destroy the eggs. They will kill the young and they will also toss young from a nest box. They're not protected by law. Their nests, eggs, and eggs can be removed. And remember that it's the male house sparrow that bonds with the box. He, you can uh, trap and remove the female and the male will not uh, disappear. This is what a house sparrow nest looks like. They're messy, made of grass and trash and uh, pretty much anything a house sparrow can find. Uh, their eggs are greenish blue with brown or pinkish splotches. They're fierce competitors for nesting sites and should never be allowed to use a nest box. Let's talk about some ca other cavity nesting birds that you might get if you put up a bluebird box. The tree swallow is one and chickadees are another. Tree swallow nests are similar in construction to a bluebird nest. They're normally made of grass or straw. They um, tree swallow, however, puts the nest cup toward the back of the nest. The nest kind of slants backward. And one of the characteristics of a tree swallow nest is that they tend to use feathers. Their nests are, uh, excuse me, their eggs are smaller than bluebird eggs and they are a pinkish white. If I could come back to life as a baby bird, I would choose a chickadee because seriously, look at that nest. Chickadees build their nests from moss, fine grass, animal hair, and plant fibers. The eggs are small, about the size of a jelly bean, and are white with brownish red speckles. The female chickadee will also weave a nest of animal hair and plant fiber and cover her nest when she leaves the nest box. The first time I had chickadees nesting on one of my trails, the nest had been built for a week or two and I couldn't understand why there weren't any eggs. And it was at that point that I realized that when the mother chickadee was leaving the nest box, she was covering the nest and covering the eggs so that I couldn't see them. So that was a learning experience. Other possibilities for your nest box are a house wren or a tufted titmouse. House wrens are native birds, but their nesting habits and attitude are not friendly toward bluebirds and other cavity nesting birds. House wrens don't usually arrive back in Maryland from their migration until late April or early May. And sometimes that's enough for the bluebirds to get a good, nest, good start on nesting before the house wrens arrive. Usually you'll see a house wren before, um, excuse me, you'll hear a house wren before you see it. And they have some strategies to increase, uh, decrease competition in what they consider their territory. First of all, the male house wren will build what we call dummy nests. He will fill any and every cavity he can find with little twigs. He does this to discourage other birds from nesting and increasing the food supply for uh, raising his own young. Also, house wrens will enter the nests of other birds and will peck and remove eggs. I've even seen them remove newly hatched baby birds. Once the babies are a few days old, though, the babies are too heavy for the house wrens to be able to uh, manipulate. Keep in mind, though, house wrens are native birds. You aren't uh, legally allowed to interfere with their nestings. The only exception to that is that if a house wren male has built a dummy nest that is not comprised of an egg cup or eggs, then you can remove that dummy nest. A tufted titmouse nest is made of grass, shredded leaves, moss, bark, animal hair, plant, plant fibers. The eggs are white and are slightly smaller than a bluebird egg. Titmice are less tolerant of monitoring than bluebirds, but may hiss at an intruder. And I've had this happen to me personally, and you would swear that bird is a snake. It sounds just like a snake. Um, something else I wanted to tell you about titmice. They are, they are uh, less tolerant of monitoring. And if you monitor more than once or twice a week, you do run the risk of causing them to abandon a nesting. Also, tufted titmice are notorious for plucking animal hair 
from an animal. Um, I've seen them land on a dog and pluck hair right from the dog as it was napping on the porch. So long story short, um, bluebirds and other native cavity nesting birds need our help. And if we're going to help, we need to do so in an appropriate way. Uh, we need to provide the safest possible housing that we can for our birds. Um, we need to be good advocates by monitoring our nest boxes responsibly during nesting season. And we also encourage at the Maryland Bluebird Society that you report any nesting data you have to the Cornell Lab of, Orn of, of Ornithology's Nest Watch program. I'd like to read you a, a few quotes uh, from a friend of mine in Michigan. Uh, she says, bluebirds have taught her a few things. First, the more you think you know about bluebirds, the more you have to learn. Second, never say never because the bluebirds will fool you every time. Third, stop sweating the details and enjoy the simple things. There are great things, there are things far greater than ourselves out there going on unnoticed right before our eyes. We have only to look. So Mother Nature has a lot to offer us if we just take the time to look around. Go outside, visit a quiet spot, sit, listen, and observe. Maybe you'll be fortunate enough to hear the beautiful song of a bluebird. Thank you to the following people for allowing me to use their photographs in my presentation. Jenny Hendershot, Matt Storms, Ed Escalante, Fauzi Emad, and Sherry Layton. Here are the web addresses for the Maryland Bluebird Society, the North American Bluebird Society, and one of the most comprehensive informational websites on bluebirds, www.cialis.org. We would love to have you as a member of our society. Um, your membership helps support the uh, conservation efforts of the society. And for more information, you can visit one or both of these websites. So do we have any questions? How often do you recommend that you monitor the boxes? Do you Once a week is, is the general rule, unless you're um, suspicious that there is something not going according to plan usually once a week is adequate. Great. Okay. Any other? I, I have a question. Hmm? Uh, when the uh, babies have fledged and, and left the nest, is it proper then to clean out, remove the nest in, in order for the, a new nest to be built? Yes, uh, we recommend that for several reasons. First of all, you want the bluebird to be, the bluebird's nest to be low enough in the box that any flying predator, crow, blue jay, what, whatever it be, uh, cannot reach into the nest. And if you let them build on top of an old nest, the young would be sitting um, pretty high in the box. Uh, the other is just basically for uh, cleanliness. There's a lot of uh, shed skin cells and, and detritus um, after, even though bluebirds are really, really good housekeepers as, uh, yeah. as it's destrious. Yeah, uh, but yes, definitely. We recommend having the nest be removed. Thank you. Sure. Um, right. We do have a few questions that were typed into the chat box. Okay. Uh, Scott asked, what is the recommended spacing for multiple boxes in the yard? There's a good question. Um, the, the basic spacing is about the length of a football field. Bluebirds are very territorial during nesting season and you really want to keep them spaced enough apart so that they spend their time nesting and yeah, not battling over territory. Um, unless you have a situation where the boxes are um, separated by line of sight, if, if they're not within sight of each other, sometimes you can have them be a little bit closer than that, but about the length of a football field. All right, our next question from Beth is, how can I find out which bird wakes me up early in the morning? I have recorded the racket. <laughs> there is a, uh, I don't remember the name of it. I know it's, uh, it's, it's the name of a bird, but if you go to the 
Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they have a program uh, there where you can, that you can download and you play the bird song and it will tell you what that bird is. All right, our next question is, when should a bird, bluebird box be cleaned out and what is the proper way to clean a nest box? Okay, um, I always try to get all of my nest boxes cleaned and prepared for nesting season by late March. Here in Maryland, they're usually ready to start building in some areas uh, by mid to late March. Um, I basically just, um, I, I have a brush and I brush the nest out. There's no reason to, there's no, um, you don't need to wash the nest box with, and use any chemicals, except for if you have um, a nesting that ends with the young dying and the deaths are unexplained and it might possibly be delete disease related, then you can um, remove all the nesting material and disinfect the box with a 10% bleach, 90% water uh, spray and then let the box air dry before closing it back up. All right, our next question is, will a bluebird pair keep using the same nest box? Some do. Uh, if they have another box that's close by, they might uh, move to a second box and then come back to the first box for a third nesting. I've had them do all uh, of those things. Um, but a lot of times, yes, if they have success and they aren't interfered with, um, meaning there, there isn't a predation to their nest or um, too much activity near the nesting site, then yes, a lot of times they will return to that same nest box. Okay, next question is, um, let's see. Who do you suggest, excuse me, um, who would you contact if you wanted to erect uh, new bluebird boxes in a public park? Is there any particular person or organization that you recommend one contacts to do such? Well, I can, I can tell you what I did. Um, to establish the first bluebird trail um, that I took on, um, I actually visited one of my local parks and noticed that there was an abandoned bluebird trail. The boxes were in disrepair and no one was monitoring them at all. So I went to um, the parks department for my county and they a lot of times will have, um, an, uh, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, but anyway, the opportunity for you to uh, suggest improvements for the park. And so I did that and I offered to take over the Bluebird Trail and restore it to its former glory. And a lot of times um, the park de parks department cannot reimburse you for that, but they are more than willing to have you come onto their property and uh, set up a bluebird trail. So that would be my first suggestion is to look at the website for the specific park that you're thinking and communicate with the park officials, first of all, to see if, um, if there are any, you know, if there is a trail there that has been abandoned um, and then kind of go from there. Um, in, in my county recently, there was a new park that had been established and there were no, there was no bluebird trail there even though it was prime bluebird habitat. And I did that, I went to their website and I uh, proposed to establish a bluebird trail and they set some parameters for me and I got the trail installed uh, by the beginning of March and it's doing pretty well. So uh, that those would be my recommendations. Excellent. All right. Um, I'm someone that had to take their uh, nest box down due to an aggressive male sparrow. Mm -hmm. Says, uh, I haven't seen the sparrows or the bluebirds for several weeks. Should I put the box back up or is it too late? It's not too late. Um, bluebirds nest several times, uh, two or three, sometimes even four if the weather cooperates, uh, times per nesting season. The only concern I would have is, as I said earlier, house sparrows, the males in particular, tend to bond with the nesting site. 
And I would recommend if you're going to put the box up that you monitor it um, religiously and to be sure that the sparrow has moved on. Um, if it hasn't, um, you can contact your, uh, Maryland Bluebird Society has a county coordinator program and you can co contact the coordinator for your county and get some advice on how to deal with very stubborn house sparrows. All right, our next question also involves house sparrows. Um, Thomas has two boxes, one with bluebirds and one with house sparrows. And his question is, if I remove the house sparrow's nest, will they then attack the bluebird nest? Yes, that, that has been reported. If you interfere with their nesting, then they will try to uh, take over the other box. Um, yes. So my advice at this point would probably be, I'm not sure what stage your house sparrow nest is. If it's still eggs, there are things you can do to make the eggs non-viable and then put them back into the nest so that the, the house sparrows can still um, take care of their eggs. The eggs won't hatch, but uh, that will keep them busy. What I would do if it were me is I would trap and remove the house sparrows. All right, our next question is um, preferences of mountain bluebirds to Eastern bluebirds. Do, will they use the same boxes? Mountain bluebirds will use the same boxes, but the entrance hole needs to be a little bit bigger. I think the requirement for mountain bluebirds is one and nine sixteenths inch. So it's just a little bit bigger than an inch and a half. All right, and Mary, I apologize. I missed your question earlier, didn't I? Mary asks, is there any data on whether they prefer newer boxes to old boxes? <laughs> um, I don't know of any, um, and I think you would probably get uh, as many answers to that question as there are nest boxes. Um, bluebirds are like people in the respect that they all have um, different personalities. They kind of, um, they don't know what's safe and they're gonna choose something that looks good to them because basically what they're looking for is a cavity. Uh, they might try to nest in your grill. They might try to nest in the poop bag dispenser at the park because there's a hole in that. Uh, they really don't know what a safe nest box is. And that's why it's our responsibility to try to uh, provide as safe a nesting site for them as we can. Um, just as soon as someone says, oh, bluebirds don't like that kind of box, yes, they do. So that's what Melinda meant when she said, just when you think you know a thing, you don't know a thing, so. All right, and Alba asks, how would you trap them in the box? And I assume she's referring to the house sparrows. Yes, I would recommend the use of a trap called a Vanert, that's V-A-N-E-R-T. It's an inbox trap. You basically set screws on the inside of the box and the trap slides over the screws and then you enable it. Um, and then once the bird goes in, it lands on the trip wire and the trap closes, trapping the, the bird inside the nest box. And then I use a, a mesh laundry bag put over the entire box, open the side or the front, however the box opens and let the bird fly out into the bag and then um, remove it from the site in that way. So yes, um, you can read more about the Van Ert traps on the www.cialis.org website. And Maryland Bluebird Society, I think we have uh, a small supply. So if you contact your county coordinator and you want uh, to have a trap, uh, let your county coordinator know and we'll get one to you. I think they're about $10. Okay, great. I think that wraps up all of our questions. Um, so okay. I thank you very much, Kathy.